brief, uh, uh, just a brief word or two about our next speaker before lunch. And it's a great friend of ours, David Nicholson, who is the president of, I suppose, Leeds, and then it became Polyconcept, and someone who has been in this industry for a long, long time. Um, apparently started off delivering pizzas, which is phenomenal. Um, I've heard David speak um, in small group settings for a number of years now, and one of the sessions that he delivered about a year ago was on the supply chain and tariffs and the uncertainty around how suppliers bring products in and ultimately have to then sell them to distributors and then distributors then ultimately selling them to end clients. And I can think of no one who has got a better catbird seat than David Nicholson given the complexity and range of their businesses that spans multiple categories with multiple manufacturing facilities across the world to come and talk to us about tariffs, how we navigate them, and how, we, and how this impacts our business. So without further ado, David Nicholson. Thanks, Mark. All right, so this is uh, my first SKU camp. So uh, just wanted to thank Mark and Catherine. They have, I would say, nicely pestered us to get involved with Common SKU for a number of years. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Um, it's been a terrific event. Uh, great meeting a bunch of you. We have a number of folks from the Polyconcept team here. We will be at, in full force uh, in Vegas at SKUCon. So uh, very, very excited to be engaged and be involved with this group. Um, it's really been terrific the last few days. Um, and then second, I think I should actually make sure I correct uh, the personal history a bit. So I did not deliver pizzas. I did serve pizzas prior to joining Polyconcept. Uh, and the very quick um, version of my personal history, so I was uh, straight out of college looking for work, waiting tables, uh, a placement agency called and said there's this little business over in Murraysville, they import leather products. Uh, that was Leeds at the time. Uh, it was about $5 million, about 30 or so people. Um, and so the story I told last night at dinner was we kind of keep track of, at least in the office staff, what number you were by your extension. Uh, so I was extension 104, so employee number four. Uh, and obviously have, have really been fortunate to have found my way into an industry and a company that has been a terrific place to work the last 25 years. So um, a lot of what I'm going to share today comes from my history, um, spending a lot of time thinking about our supply chain. It was actually, the, that was the first job I took at Leeds was import manager um, and spent, if I think, estimated about 75 trips to China over the last 25 years. Um, have been through all throughout Asia um, and wanted to share some thoughts and people always ask what keeps you up at night in our business. I wouldn't have answered this topic uh, a couple years ago, um, but one of the things I wanted to share and I think a number of the suppliers in here will certainly agree, uh, our industry faces some real challenges as it relates to our supply chain. And you know, the tariffs are certainly front and center, but I would argue the tariffs really are a symptom of a much bigger challenge. And I'll kind of lay out my thesis to start and then spend some time talking through why I believe this and, and share a lot of information uh, behind this. But um, what I believe is that we're facing a culmination of issues um, related to our supply chain that really impact the viability of that supply chain and in many ways, the underpinnings of this industry. If you think about the success of this industry, it is hard to detach it from the supply, our supply chain, and in particular, the Asian supply chain. It is, in many ways, what has fueled the growth of this industry over the last three decades, and it's the ability to find this huge array of product at increasingly lower and lower costs. And that has been a huge part of the value this industry has been able to deliver. And when I think about the threats we face, um, there are really three things. Um, and China is certainly front and center, and that's fairly obvious. But we have a supply chain. Number one, we have a supply chain that is highly, highly dependent on China. And that's 
fairly obvious, and we're not the only industry that faces that challenge. Um, you know, what China has been able to deliver, which is seemingly endless capacity and access to almost any type of product, um, they have become the global factory for the world. They've become a one-stop shop. And that's made it very easy for our industry. And so whether you agree with the tariffs or not, what the tariffs highlight is this issue we have and this level of dependency that is, I, I would argue, not going to be sustainable. Um, and the challenge we face, and I'll talk about, is there's not a good alternative to China today and not in the foreseeable future. So that's number one, China. Number two is we have a supply chain that has not changed um, and certainly has not evolved uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. The supply chain, for the most part, that, you know, as I thought about it when I entered this industry, fundamentally looks the same today as it did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, it's a it's a supply chain that depends on huge populations of low-cost labor. It's a supply chain that's not particularly flexible. And it's a supply chain that is transactional in nature. I place the order, you produce the product. What happens in between, uh, either we don't know or we've chosen, in many cases, just not to care. In a world where access to low-cost labor is not going to be a given, in a world that requires speed and flexibility, this type of supply chain is not going to be competitive. And again, it's going to require us collectively to rethink what does a successful supply chain look like. And the third issue we think about relative to our supply chain is we have a supply chain that for the most part is not, is not, and will not meet the requirements of the next generation of consumers. And remember, these consumers are ultimately the end buyers of promotional products. You think about these consumers that care about the environmental impact of the products they buy, um, that want to be associated with brands that make a positive impact, we have a supply chain today that can't address that need. And I'll share some examples from some other industries that I think are doing a pretty good job of answering that question. And I think it's a good model for us to think about. So as we look across these three issues, so China, um, what I term the next industrial revolution, but kind of the progress of our supply chain and this change in consumer demand, particularly around sustainability and transparency, those are the three issues, I think, that together threaten, in many ways, what has been the key success factor of this industry. So let's jump into China. So um, as I mentioned, I started in 1993. I took my first trip. I started in, at Leeds in, uh, I think it was February. By June, I was on a plane to China. I was 22 years old. China back then, did anyone go to China back in the early 90s? No, OK. So I assume many of you, or at least several of you, have been to China um, in, in more recent history. China back then was tough. Um, China, you know, that was kind of pre-internet, so all the communication was via fax. Many of the factories didn't speak English. And, uh, you know, these were truly sourcing adventures. You were getting in a car, you were driving two or three hours on these dirt roads, there were no highways, uh, to these factories. And um, in many cases, these factories, you were the only Western buyer um, that they had seen. So they were not accustomed to what we see today, which is being really good marketers of product. Um, this was really early days. And at that point, through the 90s, China was, we were still sourcing, I'd say, equal parts from China, but equal parts from a number of other countries and places like Sri Lanka, India, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, were all competitive locations to China. And it was a pretty healthy balance at that point. And the key turning point in the history of China, kind of from those early manufacturing days during the 90s, to what China really looks like today was in 2001. 
And 2001 was when China joined the World Trade Organization. And really, um, that uh, joining WTO gave China access to much greater access to all the Western economies from a trade perspective and really accelerated its growth. And so over the last two decades, what we've seen is China's GDP go from 394 billion to today, it's $13.6 trillion. Um, remarkable growth, it's close to about eight or 9% GDP growth per year for the last 20 years. Put that in perspective, the US averages about two to 3% per year. It's now the second largest economy um, it was the fastest economy, developing economy, to move out of poverty. Um, a staggering 800 million people over those 20 years um, moved out of poverty. And it went through extreme urbanization. Um, you had this migration of folks coming from the farms to work in factories, live in cities. Um, there are now close to 160 cities in China with populations of more than a million. Um, they project over the next five years that will double again. And so you've seen this huge transformation, and I just pulled out a couple pictures from the time period. So this is Shanghai, central Shanghai, looking over the Wangpu River to Pudong. Um, so for those that had been to Shanghai, uh, that's what it looked like in 1992. That is that same view today. That's in less than 30 years. Um, Shenzhen, so this is uh, where many of us started sourcing in the early days. This is across the Hong Kong border. Um, the view um, from the mountains, kind of looking into central Shenzhen, and that same view today. And Guangzhou, where the Canton Fair is held, this is the um, kind of entry point into um, that province. And what it looks like today. And so I pulled out, uh, this picture was, um, well, you can see it, was uh, taken from one of my early trips. And this, I, I made mention, you know, this is kind of what sourcing looked like back then. And we had this joke, we'd sit around at breakfast every morning, kind of going through the fa factories we we're gonna go see, and we'd ask our, our guy, a local guy in the office, um, okay, who are we going to see and how long is it gonna be? He said, oh, it's really close. And what we learned is really close is three hours on a dirt road, dodging uh, motorcycles, dodging cows, um, and you just hope you make it safely. And we would show up, and this is kind of what you know, a typical factory would look like in China. Um, and what China became very successful at um, over those kind of that period from 2001, 2001 when they joined the WTO to today was um, becoming, again, this one-stop shop, this global factory. Um, they had access to a huge population of labor that were coming in from the farms. It was a highly efficient workforce, um, the most efficient really uh, in Asia. And, um, but I think the really important part of what China was successful at doing in 20 years was they built incredible infrastructure. The amount of highways and trains and airports and ports that they built um, unrivals anything that the U.S. would ever even could, could accomplish in 50 years. And so the, the, um, for those that have been to Shanghai, and you remember kind of the first time I went to Shanghai and you'd go to Ningbo, you had to kind of drive around the, the whole bay. Um, China in four years built a bridge across the bay uh, that spans its longest now um, so su supported bridge. Uh, about 20 miles in length they built in four years. That would take 20 years to do in the U.S. And it just tells you the speed at which China was moving. Um, and the other thing China became very successful at, and this is critical to think about what are the alternatives to China, is that they became completely vertical. So not only could they produce the products, but they produced every component, every material, everything that went into the bags in China. And so all of that moved from places like Korea or Taiwan into China, and so they became completely vertical. And the final chapter, as you think about China, is what they have been successful at doing today. And, and so not only have they become essentially a, a tremendous manufacturer of product, 
they now have been able to create brands and create products that rival certainly many of the Western um, companies, but also any really any developed developed economy. And, and that um, probably is best illustrated when you look at uh, the mobile phone market. And so everyone recognizes the two kind of clear leaders on the left, Samsung and Apple. Um, if you look at global phone sales, the next three are all Chinese companies. And certainly Huawei has been in the news quite a bit the last few years. Um, but Xiaomi and Oppo are both um, up and coming Chinese brands and now number four and five in terms of global sales. And so what China has been able to do is not only become a great manufacturer, they are now a great uh, producer of product. And so all of this leads to this. And if a picture's worth a thousand words, this is the challenge we face. This is the issue Trump is going after, which is we have become so dependent on China that we now run a trade deficit that is uh, about 400 plus billion dollars with China. And that's an economic issue, but I would argue the bigger implication is beyond the economics, is that China's changing, and China will not be the same China that supported this industry. And as China changes, the question becomes, and they no longer are interested in producing uh, or no longer are able to produce because of changes within their economy, our types of product, what does that mean for our industry? And so I want to take, because I, I do feel like I need to spend one minute on tariffs, um, provide a quick update on the tariffs, and then kind of get back to get back to the main story. So this is the issue. This is what drove the tariffs. Uh, this is the very quick, and I'll provide these slides so you will, um, don't worry about writing this down. Uh, this is the very quick history of the tariff uh, war since last January. Um, so this started last spring, and that was largely around steel, expanded to some other industrial products um, over the last summer. And by September, uh, it started to hit our world, and this was list three. And this was the original 10% tariff on list three. Um, that increased to 25%, that, and that's Put that in perspective for our business is about, that list three represents about half of our sales. So half of our sales last year were hit with a 10% tariff, that went up to 25% um, this summer, and then kind of all hell broke loose later in the summer, and he announced list four, which covered the other 50% of products coming in from China. So as a supplier, you can imagine trying to manage a business uh, that you don't know what your costs are going to be tomorrow. And it's, it's, we could spend hours talking about the challenges that presents. It's the reality of what we have to deal with today, um, but it's certainly been a significant challenge for any of your suppliers that are buying out of China to have the president um, announce literally on a Friday afternoon on, over Twitter that the tariffs that he had told you last week were 10 percent were now going to be 15 percent and you've just set your prices, and you're like, what am I supposed to do? So uh, that's the very quick history of the tariffs. Uh, what I really wanted to spend some time on as it relates to China is what's the implication, what are the impacts? So kind of two things that are happening that we're seeing relative to the tariffs. The one is quite obvious is the impact on pricing. And this is from, um, this has nothing to do with promotional products. This looks at some of the original tariff categories. Uh, this was a Goldman Sachs study. Uh, this looked at the change in consumer prices for tariff impacted categories versus non tariff impacted categories. And again, you can clearly see uh, the dotted line is non tariff products, consumer products, those continue to go through deflation um, and almost immediately beginning in 2018, coinciding with the tariffs. Um, that prices are going up. So uh, this is happening across the economy. This is not just an issue for our industry. And obviously, the big concern is as these prices and now impact more and more products, this will have a drag on consumer purchasing. And it is not good for the economy. Uh, the second implication is uh, the impact on China. 
and this looked at the imports the first half of this year versus last year. You can clearly see China is feeling the effects of the tariffs. It is working. Again, regardless of how you feel about the policy, it is having a negative impact on China's output and export output. Um, the big beneficiaries being Vietnam, um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, Vietnam and some of the alternatives to China in a second here. Uh, there are two bigger implications that I would talk about, and I think that are, I think, much more critical as it relates to China. Uh, the first is uh, captured with this chart. And so this shows projected global consumption um, really by continent or major, kind of major economic area uh, over the next 10 years. What stands out when you look at these numbers? Asia, yeah. Asia, if you add the U.S. and Europe together, you're at 34. Asia now represents essentially the size of the primary export markets for China. Um, and we're actually starting to see this play out. This is uh, shipment data um, kind of cross-continent. And again, that big red air at 44 is shipment, shipments occurring just within Asia. And so one of the big concerns we have as this tariff situation is just kind of accelerated is that China no longer needs to export product to be successful. They have a big enough domestic market, um, and the economies around it in Asia are growing fast enough that it can survive without us, and it will survive without us. And we actually have examples of showing up at factories now where they say, you know what? We love you guys, we've been long partners. Um, we're gonna choose to focus on our domestic market and our domestic buyers. We don't need to worry about these tariffs if we're selling domestically. It's a lot more stable for us. And that's a natural reaction. So the big concern is that the tariffs have really forced the hand, but this was coming anyway, is that China is gonna move to uh, a far less export dependent economy. Um, which leads to the second implication here, which is, if not China, then where, right? And so for those that have been in supply chain or sourcing, this is a bit of the history, very quick history, I'm not gonna walk through it, of the migration um, kind of through, from kind of domestic manufacturing through to Japan, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, then to China in the 2000s. Um, we have seen, and I'd say particularly in the apparel space, a migration to some alternative countries of Bangladesh and Vietnam. But again, I think apart from apparel, if you look at the rest of the product categories, we are still very much entrenched in China. And the challenge we face is that uh, really twofold when we think about what are the alternatives to China. First is, there's just, and it's, it's uh, really a structural problem, there is just not enough capacity elsewhere. And so if you look at the five, um, five other alternative countries uh, in Southeast Asia, and you look at their manufacturing capacity, um, a 1% movement to any of these countries um, is out of China, takes up about 20% of their capacity. So purely from a capacity standpoint, there is not an alternative to China. I would argue um, that is just compounded by the fact that you still have all of the raw materials uh, and you have this tremendous infrastructure within China that none of these countries are anywhere close to replicating. So. Uh, we just got, um, we've been talking about it uh, to a factory that is, has been pitching us and making some technology products in Vietnam. And yeah, great, so we can avoid the tariff. The challenge is that when we kind of go under the covers, they're really just shipping all the components out of China and doing the assembly in Vietnam. And so it's not really an alternative. Uh, I'm not sure legally it's an alternative to the tariffs. It's certainly not an alternative from a supply chain standpoint to China. And so we think about these alternatives, 
uh, and you think about them long term. So again, remember, this is a supply chain that's depended heavily on low cost labor. And you look at, so the bars on the left represent the population growth, youth population growth. For the last 15 years, the bars on the right represent over the next 15 years. Uh, there is not one Asian country that is going to have significant population growth over the next 10 or 15 years. And so when you think about, okay, great, maybe some of these countries can start to build up capacity, they're not going to have a workforce to fill those factories. China is not going to either, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And so the question is, if it's not Asia, well, um, Africa is the only region that is going to go through significant population growth and still has a labor cost that would be competitive to manufacture our types of products. Um, the challenge uh, for anyone that's been to Africa is that it is still decades behind in terms of infrastructure. Airports, roads, shipping ports, um, just there is still a tremendous amount of development that needs to occur. So even if it has the population, it doesn't have the infrastructure today to replace China. So I don't have an answer to give you um, other than to say it is a real challenge as we sit here today and think about what is the alternative to China. And it's a real challenge for our industry. So let's just shift gears and talk about, and so the opening statement I said, you know, this is a supply chain that hasn't changed over the last 20 years. And we tend to think about um, dealing with our suppliers from a transactional nature, um, and we rely a lot on manufacturing that hasn't changed. It's still a very labor-intensive manufacturing process. And so there's been a lot of um, discussion, and this, this outlines kind of the prog in industrial progression um, really over the last century plus. So you start with, on the left, the introduction of kind of power into the manufacturing process, uh, the Henry Ford kind of mass assembly lines, Industry 2.0, the introduction of automation in 3.0, and then a lot of discussion today on kind of the introduction of technology and artificial intelligence into manufacturing. Um, all the stuff on the right is pretty exciting. It's not really relevant to our world. Um, the point I want to make here is that line between kind of the past, which has been mass production, cheap labor, and future, which is automation and technology. Um, clearly, um, the US, Europe, Japan, and the advanced economies are starting to move um, to this industry 3.0 and 4.0 model. Uh, we're actually starting to see, and I'll show you in a second here, a uh, video, starting to see China recognize that it needs to think about how do we manufacture products without these um, huge populations of labor, labor available. Uh, the big challenge is that when you look at the most obvious alternatives to China, so India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and then obviously even further out Africa, Bangladesh, and Cambodia, so places that actually still have populations, um, they are still rooted squarely in this historical mass production uh, model. And the challenge is that, and our, our belief is, is not scalable, it's not competitive, and it's not flexible enough to meet the demands of the world today. When you need to get product to market in weeks, not months. And so, um, let me just show you kind of what, uh, this is a video from one of our factories in China. Um, so let me show you what automation does look like in our industry. So that's, uh, I think, probably recognize the product, it's the uh, Swell-like bottle. Um, so they built now, a, they can do everything but the exterior kind of polishing, um, completely automated without any labor. Um, so we're starting to see this happen in China, and it's, China recognizes, again, it needs to be doing much more of this. Um, the challenge is, again, we think about 
okay, what are the capabilities of some of these other countries to take on this type of automation? Um, it just doesn't exist. And so if you think about our supply chain, and this is what it historically has looked like, it's what it looks like today, which is you know, this very linear process from design to kind of introduction in sales and marketing. It's, it takes, um, in some cases, six to 12 months to get product to market or to replenish. And you look at, um, and this is an example um, from Zara. Is anyone familiar with Zara? A fast fashion retailer, yeah. So Zara's model is they really think about their supply chain not in a linear fashion, but in a collaborative process. So it's this ecosystem where everything is happening, enabled by technology. And Zara is incredible. They will take, they'll introduce a product on the floor and within days start to feedback sales data to their factory. And the factory will adjust what it's producing based on that sales data. And it gives them the ability to, in real time, react to sales data, replenish stock in the matter of weeks, not months, um, and ultimately provide a much better customer experience in terms of having the right product on the shelves that customers want. And so this is, again, I think, as we think about what does a supply chain in the future look like, it is much more this type of model. And so a lot of what, and I'll pause here and say a lot of what I've been talking about is from the perspective of how we think about our supply chain in Asia. Um, I would encourage you to think about this from a distributor perspective and how you work with your suppliers. And just to highlight, historically what we, how we've thought about the supply chain, um, key drivers being mass production, the model being this kind of idea you place bulk commodity purchases, uh, very slow, six to 12 month lead times. Um, a supply chain where the buyer has all the leverage, which is not healthy, uh, where the relationship is transactional, and really where the goal is cheapest cost. And I'd encourage you and to think about a supply chain that is rooted much more around automation and technology. And again, I think it's one of the reasons that I would assume you guys have joined Common SKU, right? Is the ability to band together with a great technology partner and to be able to think about how do we bring technology into our supply chain and how we work with suppliers. Um, the model moves to much more test and respond and it's defined by speed and being able to think about cycle times in weeks, not months. Um, and I think most importantly that the relationship changes from transactional to partnership and where there's a level of collaboration and co-creation and integration. And, for what, and what that looks like for us and we think about our supply chain, um, today we deal with about 400 factories uh, across Asia. We anticipate um, that number going down to about 100 over the next two to three years. And it is very much recognizing that we need to be finding deeper partnerships and investing more in those partnerships than simply going out and looking for the lowest cost. And final issue, and this again, I think, think about this in the perspective of your buyers, this next generation of consumers, and what they care about and the brands that they want to be associated with. And again, the challenge I'd frame is that our supply chain, for all the reasons we've just talked about, is ill-equipped to meet the demands of what your consumers are asking for. And if they're not asking for it today, they're going to ask for it tomorrow. And let me give you a few examples here. So let me start by saying um, and be very clear around the two things Transparency does not equal sustainability, and sustainability does not equal transparency. In supply chain, they are two very, very different things. Um, so I know there's tip, sometimes a lot of confusion around that. We'll start with sustainability and why this matters, and this is, I think, somewhat stating the obvious, but um, I thought this was very impactful, and I, I give the apparel industry a lot of credit because they have recognized that uh, their industry and their supply chain is 
one of the worst in terms of environmental impact, and they're trying to do something uh, positive about it. But um, just a few facts I think that are, you know, to me were, were um, pretty striking. So first, 73% of millennials are willing to pay more for a sustainable brand. Um, if you look at the apparel industry in particular, it's responsible for 10% of the carbon footprint, which to me is staggering, right? I mean, this is an industry where you would think the environmental impact would not be anywhere close to that. Uh, Americans dispose of 65 pounds of clothing per person per year. Uh, producing one kilogram of fabric generates 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases. 23% of all chemicals produced worldwide are used in the textile industry. So again, this is an industry that has recognized its impact. Um, I think it's telling that as a promotional products industry, we can't even state our impact um, in terms of sustainability or environmental um, implications. So sustainability as a Corporate responsibility, and I think Patagonia is a great example of a company that has built its entire model and brand promise around sustainability. This, um, you guys recognize this ad? So this was an ad, this was an ad they ran um, for a couple seasons where essentially they were telling their customers, don't buy our product. Recycle, reuse, repair before you buy our product. And it was really powerful and somewhat counterintuitive, but again, to me, a great example of a brand that has stood up and said, uh, more than sales, we're gonna put sustainability first. An example of uh, an association that has taken on sustainability, this is the Outdoor uh, Industry Association. Um, and again, I'll provide the link. and not gonna go through this, but again, I think it, from an association standpoint, um, associations can play an important role in helping industries think about how do you collectively do we become more sustainable and a lot of good work going on in terms of the outdoor industry. Uh, and then finally, I think that probably the best example, this is H&M, again, another very progressive retailer. Um, you can find this on their website. Uh, this is their sustainable st sustainability scorecard. And they look at their ability to influence each of these factors, and this is across everything from design to how it's shipped um, to actually how it's sold. So their ability to influence, and then they measure the climate impact, the water impact, and the social impact, and they grade themselves. And again, a company that has said, we need to be doing more and we need to hold ourselves accountable. So again, you think about your ability to talk to your clients and to say, listen, this is how we think about sustainability. These are the suppliers that we use. We're very far as an industry away from being able to talk to our clients around what we're doing to make an impact around sustainability. And I think the same thing exists when you talk about transparency. And I think for many of your clients, this is certainly the fear in the back of their minds is they're gonna buy a product and a couple weeks later, something's gonna show up in the news around where it was produced and they're gonna be dragged into it. And this, uh, there, were, there was a, uh, a rash of these terrible accidents in Asia uh, about four or five years ago um, that really started to drive this transparency question and discussion. And this was one in uh, Pakistan, and what it gave rise to was companies saying, listen, you should know where our products are made, where we're making your products that you're wearing or you're buying. And this, again, is from H&M. Um, again, I think the same one that we looked at from the sustainability, where you can go to their website, you can see the factory location and the supplier grade for their entire supply chain. That's being transparent. And I think another great example anyone familiar with Everlane um, that has built their entire model on transparency. And so 
At Everlane, we want the right choice to be as easy as putting on a great T-shirt. That's why we partner with the best ethical factories around the world, source only the finest materials, and share those stories with you down to the true cost of every product we make. And so you can go to their website for every product. They provide the actual cost breakdown, including their profit margin. For every product, you can see exactly where it was made and the story about that factory. That is transparency. And so I'll leave you with two questions around sustainability and transparency. And these are tough questions for our industry. We think about our industry that gives away products, um, and in many cases, that product may or may not be used after the event. How do we change the perception, and I think beyond the perception, the actual reality of the environmental impact of promotional products? If our supply chain doesn't address this question, we are at significant risk. We're at risk because of the nature of our industry. We're giving away stuff that has a high propensity to be thrown away. And as consumers and companies care more about their sustainable impact, if we don't answer that question of how we're making it more sustainable and ensuring that it's going to have a useful life after the event, we're at risk of being irrelevant. And I think the same question exists around transparency. How do we improve supply chain, supply chain transparency and accountability within an industry where most suppliers have little visibility into their factories. It's easy for me to stand up here, given the size of Polyconcept and the resources we have, um, say, listen, we are in every one of our factories. We know where they are. Uh, we're doing audits on them. It's much more difficult for a supplier that is $10 million or $20 million to have, simply have the resources to be able to answer that question. And again, this is an industry made up of a lot of small suppliers. And the challenge will be is collectively, how do we address this issue? Because the expectation from your buyers will be, listen, I want you to know where those products are made to ensure that we're working with a factory that is, is, is striving to have a positive social impact on the world. These are tough questions for our industry. And so I will leave it at that. Um, we have some time for questions. We have time for yep. maybe one question. One question. I know we got tons. Here's the thing. David's yep. been here the whole time, and he's going to be hanging out with us because I know we have a lot of questions. One of the things that I want to challenge us as a community is this changes the framework through which we choose supplier partners. Right. It should, and it's dramatically altering that as well. Um, but I want to, I have a question, but I want to ask, somebody had a hand up back here. I think the reality is all of us are trying. The question was, are we moving yeah, away from yeah, China or? Yeah. Wait, waiting for the trade yeah, war to yeah. end. Uh, and I would say, again, hopefully what we all take away from this trade war, which has been really painful, is that it's a bit of a wake-up call, right? Um, and so whether the tariffs go away tomorrow, the issues that we just talked about relative to China exist, which is uh, it's less dependent on us. It's, it's not going to have the population to produce our products. In many cases, it's trying, through its own economic policies, to move away from this type of manufacturing. We have to find alternatives. Um, that's not going to happen overnight, though. I think your best case, five plus years, to where you have a situation where you can produce the non-apparel categories in a meaningful way outside of China. So the answer is uh, we're trying and we'll continue to try regardless of the tariffs. Uh, it's just not going to happen short term. David, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate right. this. Yeah. Um, again, David will be around, so ask, uh, you know, ask him some questions. And we're going to break for lunch and be back at 1.30, okay? And before we break, I just wanted to let everyone know that we do have some extra SKU camp merchandise. Every year we're always asked, can I get an extra kit so I can bring it back home for the showroom?
We have it. We have uh, what we have left upstairs. So during lunch, throughout the rest of the day, and we thought ahead. We actually packed boxes. So if you actually want to ship it back and not bring it back on the airplane, you can grab one of the boxes we've got. Okay. Thank you. See you at 1:30.